Hi, I'm uh, Joe Orefice. I am uh, the owner operator of Hidden Blossom Farm here in Union, Connecticut. Um, and we're going to do a little video session today on fencing and different ways you can fence for different animals. Um, my focus here will be uh, beef cattle and, and cattle in general. That's what we raise. Uh, we have 16 head of Hereford cattle and uh, we graze about 25 acres and the total farm is 134 acres. We also grow vegetables and uh, we have a few other things kicking around here and there now and then like chickens and pigs and things but mostly it's beef cattle and vegetables that we raise um, and our beef cattle is all in a rotational grazing system and uh, I've picked up a lot over my time on how to fence and so I, we, the thought was we would share some of that. My background is I'm uh, the director of forest and agricultural operations with the forest school at the Yale School of the Environment and um, I also have a strong background in farming. I grew up on a small farm. I worked on dairy farms and uh, plant nurseries and uh, have had my own farming operation for about 10 years. So we're going to share some of that with you today and then also hope we inspire ways for you to think about how to implement fencing that works for you and your land. All right, so we're here in uh, the middle of uh, one of our fields, which is our, this is actually our prime, primary field. This is a 10 acre pasture and um, it's set up with a, with a really solid perimeter fence. Um, and that perimeter fence around this 10 acres took me about two days to put up uh, because it's high tensile. I'm using trees as fence posts in some ways. And, uh, and it was rather relatively cost effective. And then within that, you'll see that there's 18 different paddocks and those are broken up by this temporary fence as it goes um, across and makes essentially a checkerboard in this field. Although what you see is it looks more like strips because I'm moving animals from one paddock to the next paddock and then I'm moving them on from there. And then I'm following through in this, in this time of year, I'm clipping it because I extended the grazing a little bit uh, due to bubble links. Um, but you'll see these different patchwork and that whole pattern there is about regrowth of that pasture so the livestock can come back around. And with this field, that progression goes from about four weeks ago, which would be the greenest grass, to about two days ago, which would be recently clipped grass that's gonna look a little browner and as the rain comes, it's gonna green up and grow back. And then I'll graze these at least one more time this fall, probably around middle of October or sometime into November, the cattle will come back around to these paddocks and have another round of grazing, which will save me from feeding hay at that time of the year. All right, right here we're gonna talk about um, how we make an H brace and the, the functions of this brace. This one is uh, dual purpose. It's serving to hold a gate up and it's serving to hold tension on my perimeter fence. Um, the key with an H brace is that it prevents your posts from moving with either the weight of a gate or with the tension of a fence. And so it's really important you got to think about those forces as you build this. Um, in this case, I'm using a pressure treated uh, fence post and I'm using a old telephone pole. And these are both in the ground uh, about two to three feet, well, uh, two and a half feet they're in the ground. And um, the way this system works, my posts are set, my distance is, is what I'd like it to be. It doesn't have to be any certain distance, but typically the longer the better. Um, in this case, I'm about uh, eight feet apart. And then I have a, a brace between the two posts. And this brace is pinned in here. There's a pin. And on the other post, there's a pin, which prevents this brace as I'm building it from moving up and down or falling out. Once that brace is, is in place, then I start thinking about my angle braces. And what these do, are served to hold the tension. So if we think about this fence here, pulling that post towards me, well, if this post wants to come towards me, it now is gonna push on this brace and it's gonna push the top of this post. But this post has an angle wire brace that goes to the bottom of that original post. So when this top of the post wants to go towards me, it pushes on this which pulls on its own base and holds the whole thing structurally um, intact. Because I have a gate on this, I also have a brace going the opposite way. So normally if this were just like a, a fencing corner um, or an end uh, and I didn't have a gate, I wouldn't have 
this brace on it. But because that gate holds is a lot of weight and is pulling, in that case, the gate is pulling that original post that way, I have a brace that goes from the top of that original post to the base of this one, which that puts pressure on the base here and holds that post level. So that's, that's the key. The nice thing about these braces, these wire braces, is um, you can tighten them up. So if I want to tighten this up, I can use this type of tensioner and I just twist it and I can undo it, loosen it, or I can tighten it back up. And these just slide through. And that holds the tension on that wire. Um, so that's the, that's the basics of an H-brace. There's a couple of things that are important in there. Um, you may use a ferrule to hold the wires together. This is a ferrule. Um, it crimps, you slide a wire through, you slide a wire through the other way, it crimps. You don't have to bend the wires over like I did, but I tend to do it just, um, just for an extra measure. But that prevents the wires from sliding, the friction of that crimp. The other thing um, that keeps this whole system functioning is you have a nail up top to keep this wire from sliding down. And that could be a nail or that could be a, um, a double staple, so a crossed staple. At the base of this, you may be able to see it, maybe not, but there's a staple down there. Um, so here's the nails. Any spike is fine. Um, if you have a long enough spike, you can actually use the spike as your pin and hang the end out to also hold your wire. Um, you don't have to do that. You could have a pin in here and then a nail or a double staple at the top. If you're going to use staples on fencing, um, it's best to use a barbed staple. And so a barbed staple has two barbs on each prong, and those barbs keep it from, being, from popping out easily. Um, it's not critical that you use a barbed staple, but they're, they're a lot nicer than uh, just a straight staple. So the other, the other factor that's going on in this, this H brace is how my perimeter fence is actually connecting to it. And so my perimeter fence in this case is using eye bolts that are just drilled into the, I pre-pilot drilled the post, I screwed the eye bolt in with a screwdriver just turning it. Um, you can obviously do it with a big nail. I screwed that in um, and then I hooked my compression springs on it which then are, have an insulator between the compression spring and my, my fence tensioner and that system keeps my um, fence attached to the post. There's another way of doing this. Um, the other way of doing it would be to, if I didn't want to have this insulator here, I could actually electrify my compression spring and just have this hooked right to the metal of my tensioner. And then what I would do is I would run a wire around, around my gate through plastic insulation like this. So this would insulate around my gate. Let me just pull this out a little bit more. So in this case, it would insulate around my gate. I can put a barb staple in the back, just one staple to hold it from sliding up and down. And then my wire, my high tensile wire would go through that and then back out. And that's how I would anchor an H brace at the end of a line where I may not have a compression spring and a tensioner. Um, and that's up to the user. Some users like to have a compression spring and a tensioner at both ends of a high tensile run, and some don't. Um, I don't tend to have extremely long runs. I mean, if I had like a 3,000 foot stretch of fence, then I would want to probably have a tensioner and a compression spring at both ends. But in reality, I'm going maybe 500 feet to 1,000 feet on my runs. And so one tensioner and one compression spring is for me enough. Um, you're not trying to make this a piano wire this fence, what you're really trying to do is just keep it up. Um, because it's an electric fence and it's about memory, it's not about physical force. Um, so that, that's how this all hooks up. Now a couple of, couple of notes on this from the perimeter fence. You see I have a different, different insulator here, um, or different, uh, sorry, diff this is a different tensioner. And this tensioner works the same concept as 
as these, these round tensioners, but I tend to like these a little bit better because they, uh, they ratchet and they're a little bit easier to use. Um, so there's a tool for this. I'm actually gonna grab that tool. Give me one. I always forget something. Um, yeah, first lesson of fencing, you always forget something. So make sure you have it all in your truck fairly handy. This is a, this is a tensioning tool for these ratchet tensioners. Um, and the way this works is you slide it over the tensioner. There's a pin in there. These hook onto the rounds and then I can just ratchet it. And I can tighten my fence up that way. Um, if I wanna loosen my fence, I pull it a little bit and I flip this top portion back. And now my fence can free spool. But that's how those ratchet tensioners work. I really like these a lot better. Um, I guess the risk of these, you can pinch your hands in them. So you wanna be careful. You, you know, if you're worried about that, you should be wearing gloves. Um, but these, these work pretty well if you have the tool. If you don't have the tool, they're, they're a little bit difficult. But fortunately, the tool is relatively inexpensive. Um, some of the heavy duty ones have a square uh, end on, on it and you can just tighten them this way. But these are not heavy duty and they, they use the typical way of tensioning. Um, to attach these to the compression spring, I just use some high tensile wire and I bend it around. Um, you can be creative on how you do that. You could use an S hook. Um, you could use some type of a clip like a carabiner. Um, don't use aluminum. Make sure if you're using galvanized, you're going to galvanized. Um, you don't want that, those metals to interact. But that's, that's the basics of this system. And then where we're gonna go from here is we're gonna follow this perimeter fence down and we're gonna look at how we actually hook this up to the, um, the rest of the fencing system. And the first step in that process is having an insulator on my post. And um, these nail-in insulators are pretty simple. I really like these because they're pin insulators. And so that pin pops up. If I want to drop my fence down, let's say I'm cutting trees nearby, um, or I have an animal that got out and I don't want to tear down the fence, but I want to drop it down, I can pull that out. I can pull that out. And now my fence can move down as much as I need it to. I can't do a lot here because I'm so close to the, uh, to the post, but it gives you a lot of opportunity, especially if I did that on two or three posts down the line. Um, so I like these pin insulators. They're really pretty simple. Um, and I like that I can take my fence out easily if I need to. Um, so these just nail in to the tree or into the, um, the post. So from there, we're gonna go take a look at the, uh, the rest of the perimeter fence and how we attach fencing in different ways to posts and trees. All right, so one of the beauty about a perimeter fence and having those compression springs that I showed you earlier is that it makes the fence really flexible. So if something falls on the fence or you do some like pro wrestling, right, and bounce off the ropes, it really makes a fence that's kind of durable. So this fence in particular, one of the big branches on one of these maples fell off just the other day, landed on it, pushed it all the way, all the way to the ground. Um, I came in, I cut the tree off, the fence is back and working. So that's the beauty of having high tensile wire and compression springs with a perimeter fence because it's really easy to fix and it's rather robust. Pretty much the worst thing you're gonna have happen is, is maybe an insulator popping out and then you can just go back and nail it back in. Or possibly the, the fence could break, but it's very rare for these high tensile fences to break. It would take a lot of, lot of pressure. And that compression spring prevents it from doing so. The other thing that's important with that high tensile fence is that your insulators can slide. And so we're not stapling this wire into the tree or stapling this wire into the board because that staple would pinch that wire. So if I stapled this right to the wood or worse yet into the tree, not only would I have a short in my electrical system because this plastic wouldn't be insulating, but I would have a pinch point where my fence would break when something happened. So the whole idea with this is that the fence can flex and move. It's also better for your animals because if they hit it, they're going to bounce instead of having it be a really harsh, sharp, tight wire. Um, so that, that's a pretty nice aspect of this high tensile fence. In this system, um, it's, it's a really unique system. Um, I picked it up from uh, Wellscroft Fence Systems, Dave Kennard up there. This is a insulator 
nailed to a pressure treated board held on by a couple of nails with fender washers. And what happens in this system, and it's really innovative, is that the nail goes through the board, the fender washer holds the nail. So you have to make sure that that fender washer is not larger than your nail. Anyway, that goes through. I used a galvanized nail so it doesn't, doesn't um, rot. You could use coated nails. There's different ways of doing it. There's plastic coated nails. Those could work well. Um, in any event, this goes on. I have two nails in there. And as the tree grows, it's going to push on this board. So this tree is pushing on this board. And as that tree pushes on the board, it pulls that nail out. And what that does is it prevents your tree from growing into your wire. And whenever you have an insulator, even if it's the insulator nailed right to the tree, the tree's gonna grow around that insulator because there's not enough surface there for it to push the insulator out. And eventually the tree's gonna grow around it fast enough that the tree bark is then gonna touch your line and you're gonna need to put a new insulator in and it's just gonna be a sloppy system. So this is a much better way of doing it because this board slides out as the tree grows. And I might even be able to pop it a little bit. See, I can pop that board right out. Um, so as that tree grows, those nails push. They don't need to be super deep into the tree. All I'm doing with this is trying to keep this fence from moving this way, which there's not a lot of pressure on that, or from moving up and down. Um, and these can last for a long time. So that's a really nice way of doing it. The other thing I'll show you here is another insulator option. So one thing you could do, and I'll just use this nail as if it were fence, you could have this type of insulator which is a tubular insulator. These are really inexpensive. These are uh, maybe twice the cost of these. These are probably somewhere around like 40 cents a piece, maybe a buck a piece at most. Pro I don't think they're that much, maybe 40 cents. Um, and then these are probably like 25 cents, 20 cents a piece. These would go in, you slide them all down your line at the start. And then you staple them in. And you don't crush them completely because you want them to still be insulating, but you staple them until the top portion gets compressed, the top fin gets compressed. So it doesn't have to go very far because you want the fence to still be able to slide in these tubular insulators. So making sure you're not doing a pinch point. And if you hit them too far, you're gonna, you're gonna break the insulator and then it's gonna short electricity between the wire and the staple. So these work, um, I've used them. They're nice, they're inexpensive. I like these a lot better because in this system, I can't choose to drop my fence. If I want to drop my fence, it's really easy with the pins. But um, with this, I'd have to pull the staples and deal with it. The other reason I don't like using these anymore is I got to count how many posts I'm going to have as I go down the line. And counting how many posts, well, geez, I have, I have to have 10 insulators. And then I go and do it. And I'm like, oh, I needed 11. And I missed one in the middle. It's just it's a pain in the butt. Whereas this, I don't have to do any counting at the beginning. And when it's hot and it's the springtime and you're trying to put up fence before your animals need to graze, Counting is not your favorite thing to do. Um, so that's, that's one way of attaching a fence to a living tree while doing minimal damage to the tree. It's, it's got one hole from a nail there and one hole from a nail there. Both of those holes together are smaller than one maple syrup tap. Um, and those nails won't stay in the tree because they'll get pushed out as this pressure treated board gets pushed out. And if you don't like pressure treated, you could use a black locust board. You could also use, um, I've used white cedar um, you could use red cedar boards. Anything that's rot resistant will work. Um, so you can, you can choose what works for your farm. So that's one way. And what we're going to do next is look at another way of attaching fence to a living tree without doing damage to that living tree. All right, what we're going to look at here is another way of attaching a perimeter fence to a living tree without doing, in this case, without doing any damage to the living tree. Uh, this is a, a neat product that... Um, came out from Expand Farm Products. Uh, and I'm not, not doing a lot of company pitches, but you know, this is, a, this is a innovative thing developed by farmers and I was glad to, glad to give it a try and I still use it in some cases. Um, there, for, for a tree like this young sugar maple that I don't wanna necessarily put a hole in, um, maybe it's a tree I wanna grow into a saw log someday, so putting a nail in it is a no-no if you wanna ever saw that tree into lumber. Um, or in this case, maybe I want to grow it to make maple syrup. Whatever the reason, I don't want to do any damage to this tree. 
Um, these work pretty well. And so the way this works is I have a rubber rope. So this is like a rubber tie down rope, like you might see a, uh, used in, in commercial trucking. And this rubber rope, it's stretchy, okay? So it, it stretches. And the expand insulator has clips on it where the rope comes around and then clips underneath. And that just creates a friction point that holds it. And so what I can do is I can cut my rubber rope to the proper length based on the tree. I can pull my insulator moderately tight. It doesn't have to be super tight. And now I have an insulator with a rubber rope around a tree. Um, and I can put my fence in there. And that's going to hold my fence up. Where these, they, they do well if, I mean, if, if I, a tree branch falls on this and it, Right, it can sort of hold it or they break off, but then I just go back and I fix them, right? So you get a big windstorm or something, knocks your fence down. Where they don't work well is if you have consistent down pressure. So it's fine if a branch falls on it and drags it down and you go fix it after the windstorm, but where they don't work well is if this is like the peak of a hill and then the fence is going to go down on each side um, because then you'll have constant down pressure and they'll flip over like this. They also don't work if they're down in, the, in a gully and the fence is being pulling them up. So these work well for a straight shot. They're great for a tree um, that you don't want to put any holes in, don't want to do any damage to, but you really want to be on a straight level shot if you're using these, um, these expand insulators. So, but I do like them. What I always do is I keep a few of them in my fencing bucket. So when I'm out there, if I'm running fence along the edge of a field and there's a tree or two I want to use some, I'll put them in. So I think they're a great tool to have in your toolkit. And uh, what, we'll look, what we'll look at next is how you can actually end the, uh, the perimeter fence in, uh, either in a corner or in a, uh, on a tree. So we'll, we'll take a look at that. So we're here, we're taking a look at um, what not to do. So this is sort of the old way of putting up, especially cattle fence, uh, barbed wire. What would happen is it would be stapled directly to the tree, um, living tree, tree grows around the wire, eventually, um, things happen, the trees move, right? Trees are always moving. And so we want, we want our fence to be flexible and move. And in this case, when it's stapled right to it, it can't, it can't flex and move. So barbed wire is all about sharp barbs, animals hit it, um, but it's really difficult because it's not flexible. And when you, whether this is barbed wire or electric fence, if you staple it right to the tree, the tree's gonna grow around it. And then what happens when a branch falls on it and pulls tension or an animal runs into it, you end up breaking your posts. And so we can see here an old post that was attached to this barbed wire. And at some point, something bent this wire down and snapped the post. And we end up with what is a nightmare for me as a farmer, a modern farmer, trying to deal with all this old barbed wire. Um, so this is a good example of what not to do and why electric fencing is a much preferred method for, for managing, especially cattle than uh, barbed wire. All right, so here we're gonna talk about a couple of things. Uh, we're gonna talk about how to put a post in a stone wall and how to just put a post in, in regular. Um, so what we can do is first we'll talk about how to put a post in a stone wall. And to do that, we really need to have the right kind of stone wall. So stone walls are built a couple of ways. They're often built where you have a pile of rocks on one side and a pile of rocks on the other side and the, the two piles lean towards each other, it's a double wall. So you stack them up one way, you stack them up the other way, and they lean towards each other. That's a good thing for building uh, a fence on top of it. If you have just a single stack, you're not going to be able to do a fence on top. You're going to have to just offset your post from that wall if it's just a single stack of stones. In this case, we have a double wall. So we have rocks from, from the left side and rocks from the right side being piled together to the wall. And So now what I want to do is I want to look for gaps in those rocks. And I'm looking for little holes areas, I take my rock bar and I'm just feeling down. It's a rock. It's a rock. But maybe in this gap I can find a, find a hole. So now I'm getting down. Oh, there's a rock there. All right. So it's not that you're always going to find the perfect spot, but sometimes you may find a gap and you may sink your rock bar down a couple of feet. And then you get in there and you pry around and you push some of those rocks just shim them out of the way. And as long as I'm down a couple of feet, I can get a post in there. 
And so there's a number of reasons why I want to put a post in a rock wall. One, rock walls are often on the property boundary and you might as well maximize your acreage. Two, rock walls are often on the field boundary and so you want to get your animals to graze right to the edge. Otherwise you get shrubs and invasive species all along and under your fence. Whereas not a lot grows on top of the rock wall and so it's a great place to have a fence that's not going to get shorted out by weeds. The other thing is rocks drain water really well and so posts last a long time in this rock wall. This is an old red cedar post. Um, so eastern red cedar, uh, a great wood, local, uh, locally grown, you can grow these. Um, a lot of people have them coming up in pastures. They last a long time. So this is just one I found on the wall. It was probably connected to barbed wire, um, but it's still really sound and it may, it may be somewhere around like 60 to 80 years old. Um, so it's really neat to be able to find these old posts. I'm not gonna use this one today. I just wanted to show that, that they can really last a long time on these walls. And if you get lucky, you'll find the base of this still in a hole, and then you can just reuse the same hole. Um, but those rocks draining really let your post live a long time. So in this case, I'm gonna use, um, this is a northern white cedar. Um, I picked up from when I used to live up north in, in New York from a friend that cuts them up there. Um, when I'm putting a post in a stone wall, I usually use a, a smaller diameter post just because you have more options for your gap sizes and, um, and they last a long time. So I, I would expect to get maybe 10 to 20 years out of this post in this rock wall. The other thing I did with this post is I took the ed, the top and I just rounded it off. And what rounding that off does is it prevents the post from splitting when I hit it. So this is something I picked up in uh, Bavaria, believe it or not. And it's, it's not an uncommon thing, but it was like, oh, geez, why am I not, not doing that at home? Because when you pound a post with a sledgehammer, it can split. But if you round it, you won't hit any edges, and it'll, be, it'll hold its integrity better. The other thing with this post is I sharpen the bottom with a chainsaw. And sharpening that post allows me to get in there and get into the ground. So we'll sink this in the stone wall, and then we're going to actually pull it back out, and I'll show you how to sink it in the ground if you, if you are not trying to put a post in a wall. So I have my hole over here that I found with my rock bar and I kind of made, okay? And then all I got to do is take my sledgehammer, um, a post hammer, in this case I use a 16 pound sledgehammer. Um, they're nice because they're heavy and they work pretty well. So what I'll do is I'll get up on a high spot, I'll make sure my footing is sound, and then I'll just put that post in. And when it stops, it stops, but you can see it's very firm. It doesn't have to go below frost line or anything like that because a rock wall doesn't freeze, or it doesn't uh, heave when it freezes. And there's my post, um, and that's gonna hold pretty well. And if for some reason I wanna make it better, well, I could find a new spot. I could try to pull it into place and put another rock behind it, but really, I don't have to do much here. Um, and this, this method works pretty well. It's, uh, it's been handy for me. I learned it from a 90 year old dairy farmer and uh, I was glad to know it. So I'm glad to include it in this, in this series. I'm gonna pull this post up if I can get it so I can put it in the other area. That's how tight they go in. Because what happens is you pound it into those rocks and it, the rocks pinch the wood and it really holds it pretty well. Um, but let's say you don't have this option or, or we're not in a rock wall. So two, two things. You either have a single pile wall, so you need to set your post offset from the wall, or you just don't have a rock wall at all. You just have bare ground. And what, what we would do with, with bare ground or an offset post is we just find where we want to put it. Nice thing is we have a lot more options because we're just dealing with soil. Um, and we, again, if we're doing a pounded post, we make a hole with our rock bar push it down. Oh, see that? I hit a rock. So what do I do? I offset and I move it around. And you see I'm putting this in. Oh, there's another rock. So I, I'm going to offset a little bit more because I'm probably under the wall. But again, I'm only offsetting here maybe a foot. And I'm just sending my post down, or my rock bar down. I'm twirling it around a little bit, and I'm going about a foot and a half, two feet deep. You don't really need to be below frost line 
with a good pounded post. But there you go, I'm about that deep in there. And I know there's no rocks because if there's a rock, I would have hit it with my rock bar. So then I can take my sharpened post, I can put it in the hole, and I can do this with a much bigger post if I'm not dealing with a rock wall. Um, but this is the post I have, so this is the post we'll use. I set it in, I have my pilot hole, and I can pound it down. And I'm not going to pound this all the way because I don't actually want to leave it here. But, um, but that's my post, my pounded post. And um, if I pound this all the way, I'm not going to be able to pull it up. Um, but that, that would be the way to do it. I'd give it one good hit maybe. Um, so you can get up high and you can just, a few whacks like that, it's going to go down. Once you hear the sound change in a wood post, you know you're at the bottom. Um, it'll be a duller sound. And, uh, and then you can stop. Or if you're just at the height you want. But even that, only being pounded in about 10 inches is pretty tight. So when you think about using a post hole driller on the back of a tractor and all that mess, um, it's a lot of work. Get the tractor over here by the post hole digger, you hit a million rocks. This, is, this, is, uh, this video at least is intended for the Northeast US. I hope people in beautiful rock-free soil watch it. But um, around here, we hit rocks, and this is a good way to, to make it work without that. Um, I'm using a white cedar post. You could use a pressure-treated post. There's pros and cons to all of it. Black locust makes a good post. Um, it depends on what's available in your area for what you want to use and what the price is. A locust post, um, a pressure-treated post, those are usually running like six to, six to eight bucks a piece. Uh, these run me like... $2.75 a piece, $2.75 a piece if I go up, uh, see some of my friends up north um, who are giving me not necessarily a friend deal. I'm getting a regular regular price at three bucks a post. So I kind of like these, but um, if I'm having a gate or something I want to last more than 10 years, I'd prefer to have a black locust post if I can find them. They're hard to find. Um, or I can get a pressure treated post, which are more readily available from uh, farm supply stores. So that's how to put a post into the ground. Um, I guess the last note on that is they do make post pounders for the back of a tractor where again you can sharpen the post or you could just use some of those pounders will have a flat and what that is is it's, it's, uh, it's kind of like a vertical wood splitter but instead of a, a, uh, a splitting cone on a hydraulic it's a, uh, it's a big weight that lifts up and then boom, slams down, lifts up, boom, slams down. So that'll actually pound your post into the ground um, using machinery. But if you hit a rock with that, it might just shatter your post. Um, those work well, but again, you, you, to do a post pounder, you either got to invest in one or maybe have a cooperative uh, invest in one. So those are, those are the options. Oh, and I guess the last, last point, is that a pounded post, whether with a post pounder or the way I'm showing you with a sharpened post and a sledgehammer, is gonna be much more firm than a post where you drilled the hole, dropped the post in, and like repacked it in. Um, but that said, some things like, that tele like a telephone pole um, is just too big. It's too big in diameter to pound. Really, if you're pounding a sharpened post, you're looking at stuff six inches in diameter and less. Here we're gonna take a look at how you might end a uh, perimeter fence on a, using a tree, um, or in this case, I made a corner here. Um, and there's other ways to do that, but this is just one way of doing it. What I'm trying to show is the J bolt. So this is a bolt that screws into, um, in this case, I'm screwing it into a tree. It's shaped like a J. The top comes up, it's got an insulator that comes on, and you, it's got a uh, lock washer that goes on the top. So this way the fence is still hot, it comes across and keeps going. Um, in this case, I use two different sections of wire here, just figuring if I ever want to take one down, I can, I can actually unhook that. Um, but you could also just have a continuous wire going around this and going. Uh, it, it works well, you know, this is a trade-off. I wouldn't necessarily want to put holes in this nice uh, sugar maple. Again, it's not going to kill the tree, but it's not good for the tree. Um, but this tree was in a perfect spot for the end of this line and to send, the, send this uh, fence along the other edge of the field. And when I think about the time it would take me to build a 
double H brace here, so a corner H brace into the stone wall. Um, in the cost of that, it's it's so much more than what this tree is worth. Um, and for me, I'm not looking at this tree as saw timber. I would look at it potential as maple syrup production in the future. So yes, I don't want to do it, but yes, I also want to do it because it saves me a lot of time and effort. Um, and so these are trade-offs we make. I think the key is just being cognizant of what you're doing. Um, one of the things I did with these J bolts intentionally as I left them long, knowing that I have a lot of growth of this tree that can grow over this before it ever engulfs this bolt. The other thing is if it starts getting closer to it, what I can do is I can, I can unscrew it um, out as the tree gets bigger. And uh, it works. Uh, one thing I, I also do here is I'll, I can connect or disconnect these wires just by, just by wrapping them. And that allows me to pass along that electricity through the system. Um, so it, it works well, it's not ideal. Another thing with a corner like this I could have done is I could have put some really thick insulator, like a couple of pieces of hose um, and wrapped it around the tree. So that way the tree actually wouldn't have a hole in it at all. I could just wrap the wire around the tree. But the wire needs to be in some sort of hard, hard plastic coating. So maybe one electric wire sleeve and then a piece of like one inch maple tubing. And then that can wrap around the tree and it wouldn't cause any damage to the tree at all. The tree would grow. Um, and just press the wire out. So I didn't do that in this case, um, but there are different ways to do it. Right, so here we're gonna talk about uh, interior fences. And we, uh, we have a strong perimeter fence, it's high tensile wire, but that only goes around the edge. And in this case, this is a hay field, and uh, it may be an area where I wanna move my paddocks. Uh, maybe I don't want a permanent fence line here. I wanna mow it, I wanna clip it sometimes. Uh, and so this is really nice to have a portable fencing. Um, again, it's electric, so this is an electric uh, braid. So there's a stainless steel wire that goes through this, which conducts, actually there's a, there's a few of those stainless steel wires, wires that conduct electricity. And around those are um, poly wire, which is a plastic, plastic braid. And that, when the animals touch this, it shocks, it sends electricity and shocks them. And that works pretty well because that, that braid is really easy to work with. I can tie these in knots. Um, I have an example here. So I can, I can move these, I can tie them in knots, I can pull it, but it's not as strong, not nearly as strong as your perimeter high tensile fence. What, what it is, it's easy, it's light, it's easy to move with. Um, it's being lighter than the perimeter fence, you don't need as strong of a post. So these, these flexible poly posts work really well um, just to keep it up. You can put some tension on it with them, but really they just keep it up. And the whole idea with these portable fencing, fences is that you're able to move your animals from paddock to paddock. So in this case, this area was grazed, well, this was grazed six days ago. Animals were moved after two days to a new paddock. After two days in that paddock, they were moved to the next paddock. And so I'm constantly moving them. And what that is giving, what this technology, it's really simple technology, what it's giving me the ability to do is manage my animals for grazing. So it's giving me the ability to graze this, get it to the level of uh, grass height that I want, which is like three inches, and then move the animals so this can recover. So the way to think about this paddock, it's being grazed four times through the season, two days at a time. So animals are actually only on this piece of ground eight days in the whole season, and those are two-day periods. In between those two-day periods, there's 30-plus days of recovery for that grass to regrow. And so not only am I getting better grass through that process, but I am getting more grass through the, co the, the core of the year. And so if I added up all the grass I grew on this, I'm gonna get more than if I just let the animals graze it continually all season. And the way to do that, especially with cattle, is portable poly wire. It really works well. So this poly wire, I just tie it. So I just tie just a regular old knot to the perimeter fence on the edge. And that knot just holds it. And then I may tie it ideally to another strong perimeter fence on the other side, or I might use a wooden post um, and, a, um, and an insulator, which I thought I brought one, but there it is. Um, I may just use like a screw-in insulator 
which would then go into the wooden post. I can tie a little loop knot in here. Okay, so I would have this insulator into a wooden post. I have my loop knot, I loop it through, and that's all I need to hold this fence. Um, it works really well. And then when I want to move the animals, I just come down, I lift this up, I move the animals, I put it back. It works pretty well. If I want to energize it, I take my little tail and I'll just loop that around my perimeter fence to send electricity from that perimeter fence to the interior. Because that's sort of the way the electricity works, is it goes around the perimeter fence, and then when I want to connect my interior fence, I hook it that way. So really simple system, works well. At the end of the season, I'll go around and I'll pick up all of my interior temporary fence. Um, that takes a little bit of time. Um, I go around and I just unhook it from all the insulators one at a time. I'll flip one to one side of the post and I'll leave the bottom one on the other side. That way they don't get twisted around each other. This stuff can be a real mess if it starts getting twisted around itself. So I, when I undo it, I take one, I flip it, flip it to one side, take the other, I leave it on that side. And I go down my line, taking them all down, dropping them to the ground. Then when that's all set, I go and start on one line and I just, I just wrap it around my arm like that. The key with this is that at the end of it, when you're done wrapping it around your arm, you take your loose end and you tie it nicely around here and tie it nicely around the bottom. So you have a coil of, of fencing that's not gonna come undone. And then the next year, or the next time you're gonna use that coil, you're gonna untie it from the bottom, untie it from the top, and then undo it in the same way that you reeled it up, one at a time. It doesn't take that long. Um, a lot of folks will say, well, rotational grazing takes too long. But if, if I figure how much it takes me to feed animals hay, if I were feeding my livestock hay between, well, I graze from April to November, um, and sometimes into November, if I'm feeding hay, that's like at least an, 40 minutes a day, every single day, or every other day, um, depending on how long that hay's gonna last them. Whereas this, I could set up, this in this case, this is about 10 acre field. I could set up this whole field into 18 paddocks in, in a, less than a day, once my perimeter fence is, is set. So my perimeter fence is always there. I wanna come at the beginning of the season, I spend less than a day, I put in all of my um, 18 temporary paddocks for the season, and then all I have to do is move cows every other day. It, uh, it saves a ton of time. It gives them better feed. It's better for the land. It's just, uh, it's, it's a win-win all around. So we really like this, this model for our cows. Some cows, um, you could just do one line. So I have two because my calves like to go, but for, if I had tall dairy, I'm raising Herefords, they're not that tall. Um, if I had like Holsteins or, or Brown Swiss or some big dairy cow, I could just do one line because they're way up here and they really only need one at waist height. But for me, my calves, they're, you know, beef cows are a little more stocky. Um, so I do a lower line. Usually what I try to do is I try to have one at knee height and one at waist height. And that works well for my herd. Um, the knee height is nice because my knee is always the same height and my waist is always the same height. So I don't need to get out there and measure. I just sort of go by that. Um, the only problem I have with this type of fencing that, that I run, run into is when I put it into a new area where the deer haven't figured it out yet and what happens is the deer don't know where it is and they can't always see it and so they hit it and they pull it. With this type of fiberglass post with the plastic insulator, usually what happens when a deer pulls it is either this snaps or this insulator pulls off. Um, it's not that hard to fix. I go around, either I find the insulator, I put a new one on. Um, I reset the post. It's rare that a deer will snap a fiberglass post. So I'll reset the post and then uh, just, just hook it back up. With these uh, PVC posts, they often will snap. So this is one that snapped from a deer. And so this will be set. Uh, they're nice because you can step them in. They're rather rigid. But what happens is if a deer hits that, it'll pull it and snap it or sometimes it'll just snap this, 
this off. Um, so these are nice, you know, I've used them. I've also doubled these up, like put two of them, sistered them right next to each other and used them as an end for some of this temp fence when I had to, just wrap it around. But recognize that if you're using these, there's a chance they could snap, uh, especially when it gets cold out, they get, they get more brittle then, or if they've been in the sun a long time. So these are nice, but, um, and, I, and I definitely always like to have some on hand because of their rigid, rigidity, but I recognize that they, they're not as flexible. So I, these are often my go-to. One of the reasons I like these slide insulators is if, I, if my fence is hot, I can grab one of these and I can slide it down and then I can just step over my fence. Um, another way that I get through my field with multiple paddocks is I'll just step on the fence and then I'll walk over it and I'll keep going. Um, normally I don't step on the fence next to a post because of what just happened, but if I step further out, um, that doesn't usually happen. So, especially if you step in the middle of where posts are. So those are ways of getting through your fields without having to turn your fence off. Um, but once livestock figure this out, electric fence is a memory fence. And you don't have to turn your, you don't always have to have your fence on even. I could leave my fence off for three or four days and my cows are still gonna be in it because they don't realize yet that it's, um, that it's off. Whereas pigs, my pigs test the fence every day. Um, so if it's off, they might figure it out after a short period. Um, but for cattle, that, their memory is pretty good and they don't want to get involved with the electric fence. So, um, Another post option here is uh, this one with fixed insulators on it. And uh, these are nice. They're step-in. Um, I like these a lot. The, the reason I don't use more of them is I can't adjust the heights of these insulators. So for any sort of undulation in the topography, these could be a little bit more tricky. But but these are, these are nice, nice to use. Um, and you can, with these fiberglass posts, you can get a lot of different insulator types. So for something like horses, you may not want a thin strand because horses like deer aren't gonna see it well. Um, and so you may want a ribbon, which is why these are flat like, like that. So you could put a wider ribbon in there for your temporary fences. Um, again, that ribbon will be electrified, but it'll be a, a bigger visual for that animal. All of these posts um, with the insulators, on this one and this post and this post, they're all about the same price, um, about $2 a piece, and, uh, and they last a long time. They, yeah, they're all gonna be about $2 or $2.25 a piece, depending on where you get them and how you get them. So the, the price isn't very high. Um, the rolls of this poly wire is not all that high. Um, if, you don't, if you're not good at wrapping it around your arm, um, which can be tricky and lead to fr a lot of frustration, you can buy reels for it, where when you're reeling it up, you just have like a, it's a reel that you just turn and essentially pull it in. It's kind of like a big fishing rod or fishing reel. Um, those work well. Uh, I, I get by with wrapping it around my elbow, but I also don't let other people do it. And I don't let other people pick up my fence because I know it would probably not go the way that I need it to go the next time I pull that fence out and go to use it. Um, so. so those are the key with the, with the temporary interior fence. Um, I think it really is a game changer for grazing uh, sustainably. All right, so a couple of things here. Um, this is a four-way uh, intersection of my uh, temporary fence, and I actually leave these disconnected so I can move them from one paddock, move the animals from one paddock to the next. So in this case, I want to move them from here to here, but then when I want to move them from this paddock to this paddock, I'll do it down the far end where it connects to the perimeter fence. Um, but I make sure I have this, this middle line in my paddock setup available for moving animals. And to do that, I want somewhat of a rigid post. I've done this using these PVC posts, put a rigid post in, or, and usually what I'll do is I'll sister them, I'll double them up. Um, but they tend to break, they tend not to do well. So something I went to this year, this is white oak. It's a two by three slab that I just, I had extra from my sawmill. So I just milled a few of these up about five and a half feet long sharpen the end, flatten the top, pounded them in. Um, the end of the season, I can pull them up, or I may just leave them here for the winter, but I'll take the fencing down. And then I can use my screw-in insulators to hold my temp fence, making easy uh, transitions. And if I want to connect power, I can just loop, loop wires over. So that, that's been a really nice setup for this interior fence. If these break, well, they didn't really cost me anything. They would have otherwise gone to firewood. Um, the other nice thing about having a wooden post here versus these, these PVC square posts is the wooden post allows me to put bird boxes on this. Um, and so this field, 
we have uh, bobo links in this field and we have tree swallows in this field. And I'm not a huge birder, but I have a lot of colleagues who are, and I've become quite a fan of the bobo links and, and, and the tree swallows. So, and they're nice part of the ecosystem. And so we've been trying to, trying to do some things for them. Um, one is, is put up these boxes. Um, and so these boxes sit on the wooden post and the bobo links are nesting on the ground, but the tree swallows have definitely been utilizing these through the season. Um, and the other thing we have that come into these boxes are bluebirds. And so these, these little portable wooden posts, um, they're just, they're kind of handy, throw a bird box on them and you, you now you have, uh, you can feel good about yourself, I guess, at the end of the day and get to watch the birds in, uh, in the springtime. So, and hopefully they'll eat your flies. So just thinking about how you may use your posts is, is kind of neat. All right, so we're gonna show you a, uh, a different type of fencing here than perimeter fencing or poly wire for cattle. This is, this is actually a poly net. Um, and there's a lot of varieties of poly net. There's poly net that's like four feet tall for sheep or goats um, with wider squares. There's poly net that's again, four feet tall with smaller squares, especially towards the bottom, small rectangles for poultry. Um, in this case, this is a pig quick fence. Um, and so it's for, for pigs. And all of these work in the same way where you have braided fence with a stainless steel wire, multiple stainless steel wires going through those poly braids that, that conducts electricity. So it's an electric fence, but it's a, it's a mesh, so it's easier to see for the animals. And it's also not easy for them to push through it. So something like a sheep, which has a lot of wool and doesn't conduct, wool doesn't conduct electricity well, um, we'll have to put a lot more pressure into this fence to get through it, which will then eventually give them a zap. And so they learn it, they see it, and like all electric fences, it's a memory fence. And so once they get zapped a few times with the electricity, then they decide, I'm not gonna go back in. Um, and by the way, the, the electric shock isn't the worst shock. Um, I've gotten shocked many times. It kind of feels like somebody punched you in the arm. So it's, it's, not, a, it's not, I don't consider it a cruel thing. Um, and when you think about what happens to an animal when it gets out of the fence, there's a lot of, lot of unpleasant things that can happen. So this works well. I like it. We use it for our pigs when we do raise pigs, which we, we just don't do that often um, for other reasons. But what I like about this when, if we were, when we are raising pigs is we grow vegetables. And I cannot have pigs get out on the farm. It just cannot happen. Because a pig that we're raising for ourselves getting out into our greenhouse uh, could be thousands of dollars of loss in terms of vegetables. And so we don't want that, and this works really well. The other thing I like about this pig fence is it slides up. So if pigs move sod or dirt onto it, you can slide it up and adjust where the electricity is so you're not shorting out. Um, so it works really well. Biggest thing with this is uh, you gotta pick it up. So it's designed so you can move animals around, you can separate your paddocks, you can reduce the impact on your soil um, especially with pigs, which cause a lot of damage to soil. Um, this allows us to reduce that impact, um, and so you can move it around. To do that, what you do is you pick them up, you fold them down, and then you do that for the whole fence. You grab your poles. Make sure that you're not looping fence under these spikes. You want those spikes to be free. Like, I wouldn't want to do this because that's gonna make a big tangle later on when I try to open this back up. So I wanna make sure that all my spikes are clear. I also wanna make sure that my top is clear. And then again, I just fold this under. And you do that for the whole fence and when you're done, you can roll it up. Um, so that's, that's how you maintain poly netting in a, in a good way. And then when you get it into your barn for the winter, um, make sure it's not in an area where mice are just gonna create a whole mess of a mouse nest in it. So. Um, it works great, it's a, it's a great product, um, and I'd encourage folks to use it who, who are grazing with sheep or poultry, but it's not the cheapest investment. Um, I mean, this pig net is about 65 bucks. A poultry net's gonna be 150, 180. A sheep net's probably gonna be like 120 bucks, depending on the length you get and how many electric conductors. But, um, but I do think they're, they're really worth it if it fits with your system and your livestock. livestock type. Um, the last thing I'll mention is if your animals are getting out of your electric fence, it's usually not because your fence is poor, it's because they're hungry. And so the whole idea with this grazing system, be it pigs or sheep or cattle 
um, with electric fence and rotational grazing is you are moving your animals before they get hungry, before they say, I'm hungry enough that I need to go through that fence to get what's over there. You wanna be proactive and move them before that happens. So if you're saying, well, my animals always get out, well, it's not necessarily your fence's problem. It is your lack of what they need in that area. And so we're, we're creating that with this rotational grazing. We're creating, whether it's pigs or sheep or cattle or what, we are creating lush forage by this regrowth process that occurs in the time period when we're not grazing. So we graze for a short period of time, a day or two, and then we let it regrow. And then it always is tasty. So one of the, the, the heart of your electric fencing system is gonna be your, your fence charger. Um, and there's a number of ways to go with this. I have a couple of solar chargers here that I've used around the farm. Um, I often, for my main cattle fence, um, I have a plug-in charger. Those tend to be a little bit hotter, meaning they have a little more power into them. Uh, they can charge a bigger area. I think the one I have in here is a 50 mile charger or 100 mile charger. It, it does, it charges two joules of energy. Um, and there's, there's different ones, you gotta size it to your livestock. Um, these portable ones I'll use if I, on some of my paddocks that are further away. I have a couple of paddocks where I don't have electric hookups, so I like the solar ones. I've gone to this 30 mile charger. Um, it's worked fairly well. In the winter time, I've had issues where it's not charging enough, but in the summertime, I get plenty of recharge from the solar panel. Um, and it, it works well. The biggest thing with any fence charger is make sure you have a good ground rod. So you want your ground rod to go into the ground. If you have dry ground, you're gonna maybe need two ground rods. Um, but in, in where I am in, in Connecticut, we have pretty good soil moisture. And so one ground rod usually does pretty well. I put it into about that depth. Um, you may wanna go deeper if it's permanent so you don't hit it with a lawn mower. Um, make sure you're not putting it into anywhere where there's buried electrical wires uh, for obvious reasons. And then what you're gonna do is you're gonna hook your ground, which is, in this case, it's the black insulator there. I'm gonna hook a wire into there, and then I'm gonna have a hot wire coming out, which would then just wrap around my fence. And when I would turn this on, it's what it's going to do, it's gonna send an electric shock through this hot wire, um, and then it's gonna ground that electricity through your ground rod. And if you touch your ground rod, you're gonna get, you may get a little zap. Um, but it works pretty well. It keeps the system going. The key is to size it to your system. And, and you can go off manufacturer recommendations for that. Um, but these, these work really well if you're looking for solar and plug-in works just as well. So charger's important. This stop, we're gonna talk about watering systems. And when you're moving animals on pasture, you gotta think about water. It's a key component of it. Um, there's two actually things they need here. We got water and we got a salt block. So depending on what your pastures need, definitely think about salt. Um, this is a fencing video, so when we're thinking about your salt block placement, biggest thing with this is make sure that the cows aren't going to, or the animals aren't going to slide it under the fence and outside of your pasture, especially as the block gets uh, eaten down more, it weighs less, it can slide out. So I always try to make it a little further in the pasture. Anyway, simple thing, um, but watering systems are key. This is a nice cheap watering system I've used for about a decade. Um, in fact, I've used most of all these parts for that amount of time. And it's really simple. I have a 55 gallon plastic tub. Make sure you have one that didn't have some sort of toxic chemical in it. Cut it, cut it in half, take the bottom half. Um, I just, you don't have to have a hole in it. I did drill a hole in this one. So in the back there's a cork, but I, I, honestly with cattle, if you're strong enough to flip this over, you don't need that cork. Um, what happens here is they drink and then uh, it refills. So let me dump some water. So there's our float refilling. And this is a really simple system. It's about a, about a simple system, about a $24 float. Um, it lasts a long time. You screw a hose into it. Um, the float gets you all wet. Uh, the float has a little valve in there with a rubber gasket. When the water fills up, it stops. And so that's a really nice way. This is easy for me to move. I can put this down. I can flip my tank. Now I have a plastic tank that I can carry around. You see this one has a cork in the far side um, only because I've used it for other things in the past. Um, I don't suggest putting a hole in the bottom of it unless, you're, unless you need to be able to drain it to, to dump it. Like if it's too heavy for you to dump as a person. Um, because sometimes the cows will get after that cork and like nip it and then you lose your water. 
So when I do have a cork in it, I put the cork towards the outside. So that way the animals don't want to get after it with their mouth. Um, the last thing on this water tub that I, one of the reasons I really like it, um, one, it's cheap, which I really like, and two, it's plastic. So if the fence touches it, it doesn't electrify my water. Um, I've used metal tubs. They're nice in some ways, but the problem with a metal tub that you always risk, and I had this once with a bull who I had in a separate pasture, was the poly wire touched the tub, and so then he was afraid to go drink from that metal tub. Fortunately, I figured it out the same day it happened, but um, I quickly switched him to a plastic tub and had to show him like, hey, you can drink the water. So you'd be in a really tight spot if you have a metal tub and your electric fence is electrocuting that, that metal tub. It's not gonna hurt your animals, but they're not gonna be able to get water, and that's really important. So if you are gonna use a metal tub, I suggest that you have, because the tub may move or it may not, or the fence may move and touch it. So I suggest if you have a metal tub, really put a fence post or two behind it to prevent that fence from hitting that tub. Um, so that, those are the main components of the system. I use, a, you know, if you have irrigation set up, if you have irrigation set up on your farm, you can use, um, you can use your irrigation, you can take a regular garden hose, hook it up to your, uh, you know, your frost-free valve or whatever. I don't have ir irrigation here set up yet. Um, so I use this plastic half-inch um, diameter poly hose. It's pretty cheap, a thousand feet of it um, is a couple hundred bucks and a thousand feet goes a long way. There's quick fittings that I can just, I can undo or I can put back on. And it, um, it makes for a pretty easy system to move water. And so I'm gonna move this to the next paddock where we just move the cows. And I'll just undo this. I'll drag the hose around to where I need it to go or I'll tee off somewhere and, uh, and make it work. This stuff is nice too because I can just cut it with a knife and then get one of these easy lock fittings and just put the fitting right on it. So it's not like a hose clamp where you gotta clamp it and do a whole bunch of mess. This poly hose is pretty simple. So that's, uh, that's a watering system. All right, this uh, last session here, we're gonna cover just some of the tools. Just go quickly over some of the different things you may wanna have on hand if you're gonna be putting up some electric fence. Um, I'm not gonna get into all the temporary fencing things because really those are just posts and wire and some knots. But if you're thinking about putting up some perimeter fence, you're definitely gonna want some high tensile wire. Um, focus on high tensile wire. I always keep a little roll of 17 or lower gauge, or sorry, higher gauge wire, thinner wire, more flexible, pliable. I keep it around because I like having it for connecting one fence to another as sort of a, a, something to span the gap. But do not make a, a perimeter fence out of this stuff. It breaks, um, it snaps, it doesn't stretch well. It really is, you're gonna put a lot of, money and time into putting this up and it's going to last you about a year or the first deer that goes through it is going to make just a terrible mess um, whereas this high tensile wire won't kink very easily it'll stretch it can do all of the great things that, I, that you may have seen in this video like you can sit on it and play pro wrestling off the ropes right it's it's nice stuff um, invest in it and if you're going to invest in high tensile wire invest in a spinning jenny so this is your way of getting the wire off of the coil without the coil going into some wild bird's nest that you will never be able to get back. Um, and it costs about 90 to 120 bucks for uh, 5, 000, about 5,000 feet of high tensile wire. So you, you get pretty good distance um, for what you spend and, and it's really gonna last you probably your, your whole career farming. Um, it's, it's not gonna break down. And if it does break, you can, you can splice it using a, using a ferrule. Um, so with the spinning jenny, it just spins and lets the wire come out. And if you're going to be using a spinning jenny, make sure you have safety glasses on because that wire uh, can definitely come up and hit you in the eye. So if you're working with this stuff, safety glasses are a really good idea, as are leather gloves. Um, and the spinning jenny is, is really critical. You can see right now, this coil, it's all under tension. This wire wants to expand and this, this is being held by this piece here. So um, if I were to take this out, then I could uncoil it. And what I do is I stick this pin in the ground and then I just start pulling. Um, and, and it tends to work pretty well. Other tools I have here, um, I, I mentioned the ferrules, which uh, hold the, um, the two pieces of wire together. You've seen tensioners already. This is a, a round tensioner. Um, you have a um, 
a ratchet tensioner. You also have a tool for the ratchet tensioner. And if you want to use the round tensioner, you will need a, um, a ratchet to go into the, the square slot. Little plastic hooks for going into wood for your, for your temporary fence are really worthwhile. Don't use these on your high tensile, they're just going to break on you. But for your portable poly wire, those are really handy. You may want um, a gate handle for either some of your high tension wire when it's not under tension if you're just going to make a wire gate um, or if you're going to make a gate for your um, portable poly wire. These can be handy. Compression spring for your perimeter high tensile fence, an eye bolt. This is a fencing tool. Um, so the fencing tool has a lot of different values and uses. It's got a little hammer on the end. Um, it's got crimps on it so you can grab the wire. So if I wanted to grab this wire, I can pinch it in there and I can pull it and I can bend it and I can twist it and I can do all kinds of things that otherwise I wouldn't be able to do with my bare hands um, unless you have incredibly strong hands. So this is a really nice tool. I can also pull it using the, the internal portion there. Um, and what I use this for is crimping my ferrules. So if I want to take this ferrule and I want to crimp it, so I put my wire through it, both wires, and then I'm going to crimp it tight. I use this portion of the tool, I put my ferrule in it, and I'll waste a ferrule and I'll crimp it. And that crimp is enough to hold that. This is a longer ferrule. Um, I keep these in, in, on hand if, I own, if I'm like splicing a wire so I can crimp both sides. But that works really well. I bought a crimping tool once for these ferrules. It's a specific tool pur purposely made to crimp them. Um, and it just didn't work. Um, so I already, I already have my fencing tool, I'll use it for all kinds of things. I might as well use it for crimping. It's one, one thing. The other thing this has is wire cutters there and there. So if I want to cut this high tensile wire, I can just squeeze it and cut it. Again, you saw that piece fly off. It's good to have safety equipment if you're working with these tools. I like to keep a framing hatchet on hand um, when I'm doing fencing. The hammer head is great for pounding in staples and nails. Um, the hatchet head is great for trimming any brush that's in the way or a stick or shaving a post flat, whatever I need to do. This is really the tool I like. The only downfall is the, the nail puller doesn't work that well, but I don't deal a lot with pulling nails. And if I need to pull a nail or a staple, I can pinch it with the front of my, with the front of my fencing tool. And so on a staple, if I have a staple and I want to pull it out, I can grab it like this and then I can use the horn of my tool to pry that staple out. So it works fairly well. So that's, a, that's another use of this fencing tool. Um, if these get stiff, mine's a little stiff, soak it in some diesel fuel, not gasoline, diesel fuel. It'll, it'll loosen it right up. So those are some of the tools I keep on hand. Uh, most important tool is a thing of water um, when you're putting up fencing. So, I'd like to uh, thank everybody for, for tuning into our, our series here, or our video on uh, fencing. I hope it helps you on your own farm. Um, I hope it thinks about, gets you to think about creative ways to better manage your pastures and your livestock, um, to grow more grass. And uh, I also encourage you to check out and see what other farms are doing, because we showed you a couple of systems here today, but really you need to adapt your fencing to the farm. And uh, uh, some friends of mine once gave me really good advice that they use when they're managing their own farm. And it is asking themselves, is it good for the land? Is it good for the animals? And is it good for the people? And that's what I, th I think really great questions to think about. Well, what is the fencing type? Is it good for us? Does it work for me as a farmer? Does it work for my animals? Will it keep them in? And does it work for managing the land in a really sustainable way? Um, I also want to definitely thank the, the sponsors uh, who helped us put this video together. It's incredibly generous and I, I do think it'll go to uh, improve the way land is managed and farms are uh, increasing their sustainability in our region. So thanks to our, our funding sponsors. And I also want to thank all the collaborators on this video who helped make, make, uh, make it possible to put it together. So thank you all very much and uh, happy grazing.